You're watching a message from Dr. Jim Dixon, founding senior pastor of Cherry Hills Community Church. Jim studied the scriptures, history, and current events to prepare purposeful and insightful sermons. Enjoy this sermon and be blessed. Well, this is Stewardship Sunday, and on this Sunday, we have another passage from the Apostle Paul, a scripture is taken from 2 Corinthians, it's taken from chapter 9, verses 1 through 11. So 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1 through 11. <clears throat> it is superfluous for me to write to you about the offering for the saints. For I know your readiness of which I have boasted about you to the people of Macedonia, saying that in Achaia they've been ready for a year. And your zeal has stirred up most of them. Nevertheless, I am sending the brethren to you. I am sending the brethren to make sure that our boasting about you is not vain in this case, that you might be ready, as I said that you would be, for if some of the Macedonians come with me and see you not ready, it will be humiliating for us, not to mention you, because we were so confident. I thought it necessary, therefore, to urge the brethren to go on to you ahead of me to arrange in advance for this gift which you have promised, that it might be ready, not as an exaction, but as a willing gift. The point I'm making is this. He who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. But let each person give as he has made up his own mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that you may always have enough of everything and may be able to provide abundantly for every good work. It is written, he scatters abroad, he gives to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed for the sower and bread for food will also supply and multiply your resources and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way because of your great generosity, which through us produces thanksgiving to God. This ends the reading from God's holy word. Let's pray together before we have our message. Dear Father, you have given so much to us. You have given your only Son. Lord, help us to give back to you in gratitude and with great joy. May the words of my mouth May the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> in Jerusalem today, you can see the ruins of the pool of Bethesda, sometimes called the pool of Bezatha, sometimes called the pool of uh, Bethsaida. But it was there, as we are told in John's Gospel, the fifth chapter, it was there at the Pool of Bethesda that our Lord Jesus Christ healed a man who had been paralyzed for 38 years. Now in Jerusalem today, right next to the ruins of the Pool of Bethesda, there is the church, the church of St. Anne. But who was St. Anne? She's not mentioned in the Bible. She is, however, mentioned in other ancient literature. 
She's mentioned in the apocryphal writings, such as the Proto-Evangelism of James. And we are told in those ancient writings that Anne was the mother of Mary and the grandmother of Jesus. In those same writings, we are told that Joachim was the father of Mary and the grandfather of Jesus. Saint Anne and Saint Joachim, the grandparents of Jesus Christ through Mary. Now there have been times in Christian history where Saint Anne has been very popular. That's why a church is built and, and erected in her honor in the city of Jerusalem. There have been times in history where Saint Joachim, the grandfather of Christ, was a popular saint. And that is why outside of what is today called Czechoslovakia, near the city of Prague, there is a valley called Joachimstal, which means the valley of Joachim, named after Saint Joachim, the grandfather of Christ. Now in the 16th century, in that valley, in the valley of Joachimstal, the primary coin of Europe was minted. And it circulated throughout the European world. That coin, because it was minted in the valley of Joachim, in Joachimstal, therefore the coin was called Joachimstaller. And it had a picture of Saint Joachim on the face of the coin. Now eventually, that coin, instead of Joachimstaller, began to just be called Staller, and then eventually the word Staller became Dollar. And today, whenever you look at a dollar, when you look at a dollar, you should think of the grandfather of Jesus Christ, because etymologically, the word dollar comes from Staller, which comes from Joachim Staller, which refers to the Valley of St. Joachim. Now, I think it is true, however, then most people, when they look at their dollars, when most people look at their money, they do not have a religious thought. They do not think of St. Joachim. They do not think of the grandfather of Christ. They do not think of Jesus Christ. And even though our national motto, In God We Trust, is boldly imprinted on all of our currency, most people, when they look at money, do not think of God either. But this morning, on this Stewardship Sunday, I would like us, as we think of money, to think of God and to think of Christ and what Christ wants to do with our resources and what Christ, how Christ expects us to view money. Now, we have two teachings this morning from 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And the first teaching is this. So bountifully. So bountifully. That's what Paul tells us as Christians to do with our money. We should sow for the kingdom of Christ bountifully. Paul says, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. So bountifully. Now the Apostle Paul is speaking in the context of the Jerusalem collection. 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9 refer to the Jerusalem collection. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, Galatians chapter 2. These are passages that refer to the Jerusalem collection. The Jerusalem collection was taken every Lord's Day throughout the Gentile churches in the time of Paul, every Sunday. People made an offering for the poor. It was called the Jerusalem Collection. It went to poor Christians, men and women, believers in Christ who were poor, most of whom lived in Jerusalem. Many of the Christians in Jerusalem were poor because they were Jewish. And as Jews who had accepted Christ, many of them were banished from their families and their jobs and had no means of income. So Gentile brothers and sisters throughout the Roman world sent money to the poor Christians. It was called the Jerusalem Collection. Sometimes it was called the Logia, which means the extra collection, the second collection, because it was over and above the normal collection taken on the Lord's Day for the ministry of the local church. 
Now, Paul speaks often about these collections, and he speaks often with regard to the subject of money, as did our Lord Jesus Christ speak often with regard to the subject of money. And Paul is reminding us that as we, as we give to the people of Christ and as we give to the cause of Christ and to the work of Christ, we need to sow bountifully. That's what it's all about. We're trying to bear much fruit for the kingdom of heaven on this earth. And if that's a Christian, if you're, if you're a Christian, that's what you need to be about. That you're seeking to bear much fruit for the kingdom of heaven on earth. That is why Jesus said, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And I have appointed you to go and bear much fruit fruit. Now last Sunday, we had our staff retreat, and after the church service, all of our staff and our elders went to Trail West, a young life <coughs> camp at Buena Vista. And we were there Sunday evening and all day Monday until Tuesday afternoon, spending some time together. We had the chaplain at Westmont College, Bart Tarman, come and speak to us. It was a great time together. Now, at our staff and elder retreats, Monday afternoons are free. And that's when people can do whatever they want to do. Barb and I kind of hung out together and just had a good time um, taking walks and having a drive. But some people went and played golf on that Monday afternoon, and one of them was John Patterson. Most of you know John. John's the head of our pastoral care department. If you've been in the hospital, it was probably John who came to see you and minister to you and serve you, pray for you. We all love John. Well, John wanted to play golf Monday afternoon, but he didn't bring his golf clubs, and, and I had my golf clubs in the back, and he wanted to, to borrow some golf balls from me. I gave him six golf balls, which is said he said was all he needed. Well, later that afternoon, I came back to my room, and right outside the door, he had placed eight golf balls. And there was a little note, and it said something like this, Master, you delivered unto me six golf balls. Here I have made two golf balls more. <laughs> now, of course, John, in his humorous way, was referring to the parable of the talents in the Bible or the parable of the pounds. And in these parables, we are told that our Lord Jesus Christ has entrusted to us his property. He has gone away to receive kingly power. One day he will come again. But he has entrusted to us that which is his. And all Bible scholars agree the message is this. We are to use all of our time. We are to use all of our talent. We are to use all of our treasure to further his kingdom. To seek the advancement, the growth of his kingdom. And are you doing that? This morning, as you sit there in that chair, in this worship center, can you honestly say that you are using your time, your talent, your treasure to grow the kingdom of Christ on earth? Is that what you're about? The choir this morning sang a great hymn, one of my favorite hymns, It Is Well With My Soul. Most of you are familiar with that hymn. Some of you know the story behind it. The hymn was written by Horatio Spafford, in the year 1873, Horatio Spafford was a committed Christian along with his wife, Anna. They lived in Chicago. They were affluent. Horatio Spafford was a brilliant attorney. It was November 22nd, 1873, when the Ville de Havre, a luxury ocean liner, was crossing the Atlantic from America to Europe. And it was 2 a.m. on November 22nd in the darkness of night when the Ville de Havre collided with another ship called the Lockern. The Ville de Havre sank in 12 minutes with hundreds and hundreds of people. On board the Ville de Havre was Horatio Spafford's wife, Anna. Anna Spafford and their four children, their four daughters. They were going to Europe to have a little holiday, and Horatio was going to join them two weeks later. 
Anna Spafford brought the four kids out onto the deck in those panicked moments. Her newborn child she held in her arms and the other children held onto her arms and legs and they huddled there as the waves swept over the deck and the ship went under and they were thrown into the sea. Anna Spafford remembered how in those desperate moments she just tried to grab hold of her children's arms and legs, but she passed out. She woke up in a lifeboat. Her children were gone. They were lost at sea. She alone was saved. She was taken to Cardiff, where she sent a telegram to her husband, Horatio, saved alone. He boarded a ship to cross the Atlantic and see her, and when he came to the spot in the Atlantic Ocean where the Ville de Havre went down, it's there that he wrote that great hymn the choir sang this morning, It is well with my soul. When peace like a river attendeth my soul, or when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Now, Horatio Spafford missed his four children desperately, even as he crossed the Atlantic. And that's why he wrote that fourth verse, O oh Lord, haste the day when my sight, when my faith shall be sight, the clouds be rolled back like a scroll, the trump shall resound, the Lord shall descend, even so it is well with my soul. Now, Horatio Spafford and Anna Spafford were devastated, but they did not lose faith. They lived on this earth to serve Jesus Christ with time, talent, and treasure. They returned to Chicago, and they went to work. Anna Spafford went to work for D.L. Moody, the famed evangelist. She sought to lead street people to Jesus Christ. Horatio Spafford continued his practice as an attorney and gave money to various ministries in Chicago and around the country. And in 1876, after the great Chicago fire, when the Moody Tabernacle burned to the ground, it was Horatio Spafford who gave great gifts, uh, large financial donations to rebuild the Moody Tabernacle. And they had two more children. And they began to build their life anew. And then in 1881, they moved to Jerusalem, where they used their money to establish the Jerusalem colony. And there, in the name of Christ, Horatio and Anna Spafford, and later their kids and their grandkids, in the name of Christ, they ministered to the poor, whether Jewish or Palestinian, it didn't matter what their race or nationality was. In the name of Christ, they reached out and they established orphanages and they shared the love of Christ with people of all ages until the day they died. And when Horatio Spafford died, D.L. Moody crossed the Atlantic to visit Anna. He was close to them. And he knew the kingdom of heaven had lost a warrior on earth. And he sat there in the Jerusalem colony in the city of Jerusalem and D.L. Moody wept. It said that he cried so profusely he just left puddles on the floor. He loved this man, and Christ loved him. He gave bountifully. He sowed bountifully. I have a quote I want to read to you from Horatio Spafford. He wrote this to his sister just days after the sinking of the Ville de Havre and the losing of his four children. He wrote this, on Thursday last, we passed over the spot where she went down in mid-ocean, the water three miles deep. But I do not think of our dear ones there. They are safe, folded, dear lambs in the hands of Christ. And there, before very long, shall we be too. In the meantime, thanks to God, we have an opportunity to serve and praise him for his love and mercy to us and ours. I will praise him while I have my being. May we each one arise, leave all, and follow him. Are those amazing words from a father who had just lost his four children? But a man, a man who understood that he was on this earth 
to sow bountifully. And I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what hardships you've faced, whether they be relational or spiritual, financial, medical. I don't know what hardships you face, but I know this in the midst of it. You've been called to sow bountifully. I hope you understand. This church is seeking to sow bountifully for the kingdom of heaven on earth. And our junior high ministry, our middle school ministry, which was a few years ago, we only had 30 to 40 kids. Now we have over 200 every Sunday. Our high school ministry has grown more than three times over. We have over 1,000 children here every day of the week in our various schools. And we have over 1,000 children here every Sunday morning. And we're seeking to reach out to people of all ages Regardless of socioeconomic status, we just want to love people with the love of Christ. We're seeking to transform this community and elevate the inner city and to raise up the poor. We're seeking to impact this nation and this world. And to do this, we need a mobilized congregation. Congregation mobilized in ministry, giving people giving of their time and of their talent and of their treasure. We have a challenging operating budget in our church this year, and we're behind. And we need to dig a little deeper. We conclude this year our Growing by Grace campaign. We're $1 million behind. We need to dig a little deeper. We need to be a little faithful, a little more faithful. You know, in this church, uh, we rarely mention money. If you're new to this church, this is probably the first time you've heard me speak on it. But, but the reality is, it's all part of serving Christ in this world. We're called to sow bountifully with our time, with our talent, with our treasure. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and I have appointed you to go and bear much fruit. And then we are to not only sow bountifully, but... We're told in this passage we are to give cheerfully. Give cheerfully. Let each person give as he's made up his own mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. A cheerful giver. Now there's an old joke about people who are on an airplane. The airplane was still at the airport, still at the gate, they hadn't left. And the people were sitting on the plane and they were just waiting and they were becoming impatient. Finally, there was an announcement that the reason they were delayed was the pilots, were, the pilots weren't there yet. Well, eventually the pilots came and for some reason they came up the back of the plane so they had to walk through the passenger cabin to get up to the cockpit. And as they entered the passenger cabin and, and the people looked around and saw them, they were stunned to see that the two pilots were blind. And one had a seeing eye dog, and they both had canes for the blind, and they were using those canes to make their way up the aisle as they found their way to the cockpit. And then when they went into the cockpit, they just closed the door and went in there, and there was a great rumble in the passenger cabin. <laughs> People were just like, what's going on here? Is this some kind of a joke? And they were very nervous, as you can imagine. But then the engine started up, and they began to taxi away from the gate, and they made their way to the runway, and pretty soon they were zooming down the runway, and the engines were getting louder and louder, and the plane was moving faster and faster. And eventually it was evident that they should have been airborne, but they were still on the ground, and the plane was still accelerating, going, had, it had plenty of speed to leave the ground, but they were still just accelerating on the ground, and they began to panic, and they began to scream. Then suddenly the front of the plane lifted off and they went up into the air. And one pilot turned to the other one and said, Boy, one of these days they're not going to scream and we're not going to know when to take off. <laughs> now, of course, it's a dumb joke, but it certainly is true that... It would be scary and extremely dangerous to have blind pilots. Now, the Bible tells us that we live in a world that is blind. Jesus tells us we live in a world that is blind. 
In fact, our Lord Jesus tells us that in this world, the blind are leading the blind, and they are all destined to fall. A world that is spiritually blind. And because the world is blind, the world does not see the truth. Now, Jesus tells us the truth is it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. But because the world is blind, the world doesn't really believe that. Most people in the world, in their heart of hearts, believe it's more blessed to receive than it is to give. But Jesus tells us the absolute truth. It is more blessed to give than it is to receive. This is reality. This is things as they really are. More blessed to give. And the word for blessed, which Christ uses, is not the normal word for blessed, the word eulogia, but it's makarizo, which means happy. You find happiness through giving. Happiness through giving. And Jesus wants us to understand that the more we give, the happier we will become. Now, this is October 31st. October 31st. It was on this day in the year 1517 that the Protestant Reformation began. It was on this day, October 31st, on this day that Martin Luther walked to the castle church at Wittenberg. On this day, he nailed the 95 theses to the church door at Wittenberg, and the Protestant Reformation began. And what was he protesting? Above all else, he was protesting the selling of indulgences because the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, at that time was selling indulgences. And people were buying indulgences giving money to the church in order that they might have their sins forgiven. They were paying to get their sins forgiven. And they were buying indulgences that they might get time off in purgatory. And they were told that the more they gave, the more time they got off in purgatory. They were also told, this was a neat little gimmick, they were also told that they could get time off in purgatory for their loved ones and relatives. They could buy that through the buying of indulgences and the selling of indulgences. A tragic time in the history of the church. Catholics and Protestants agree on that. A tragic time. They were trying to get Christians to give, but they were not motivating them properly. You cannot force people to give. And even here, Paul says, you should not give reluctantly or under compulsion. God wants you to give cheerfully. God wants us to give freely. And the word for cheerful here is the Greek word hilaros. It's the word from which we get our English word hilarious. Literally, it says, God loves a hilarious giver. And the word hilaros refers to joyful extravagance. That's how God wants you to give for the work of the kingdom of heaven. He wants you to give with joyful extravagance. In Matthew chapter 26 and in Mark's gospel, the 14th chapter, we read about the woman who gave, who came with an alabaster jar of costly perfume and poured it on the feet of Christ. Tears of joy filling her face, her face because she had found forgiveness in Christ. That's joyful extravagance. And that is how Christ wants us to give. He wants us to give with joyful extravagance. Well, of course, October 31st is not only the day that the Protestant Reformation began, but October 31st is also, of course, Halloween. And tonight, perhaps some of you will be trick-or-treating with your children. Halloween is the Christian name given to a pagan festival. 
And 2,000 years ago, the Celtic people began their new year on November 1st. And in conjunction with the beginning of the new year on November 1st, they had the festival of Samhain, which was their festival of the dead. It corresponded to the Roman festival of Feralia, which was also a festival of the dead. It was an occultic festival with spiritism, with the conjuring up of spirits and the effort to communicate with the dead. When the Christian world came into the Celtic world and into the Roman world, they tried to Christianize these pagan festivals. And so November 1st, instead of being the Celtic festival of Samhain, November 1st became All Saints Day. All Saints Day. And instead of a festival of the dead, the Christian church decided to, on All Saints Day, remember those, Christian, those Christians who had lived and died. All Saints Day was when the Church of Christ gathered to celebrate the lives, the exemplary lives of loved ones in Christ who had lived and died. And the night before All Saints Day was October 31st, and it was called Halloween, which simply means Holy Night. Holy Night because it was the night before All Saints Day. How strange. How strange we live in a culture that has kept the Christian label but returned to the pagan roots. Kept the Christian label but returned to the pagan festivities. But this morning, on this October 31st, I'd like us to remember as we close a loved one in Christ, a Christian who has lived and died. And the person I'd like us to remember this morning is Payne Stewart. And Payne Stewart was a PGA golfer who twice won the United States Open. He died Monday. He died Monday when his Learjet took off from Florida on its way to Texas. Apparently, they lost cabin pressure. Aviation experts do not fully understand what happened, but they died on that plane long before the plane crashed. And of course, the plane, that Learjet, continued on autopilot for 1,400 miles until it crashed, moving more than 600 miles an hour into a desolate area of South Dakota. Payne Stewart was something of a controversial man. Some thought, some thought him arrogant. Others liked him. But all agreed he had changed this last year because, you see, this last year, Payne Stewart had accepted Jesus Christ. He'd asked Jesus into his heart at the First Baptist Church in Orlando, Florida. It was his daughters, Chelsea, his 13-year-old daughter, and Aaron, his 10-year-old boy, and his wife, Tracy, they're the ones who led him to faith in Jesus Christ. And through them, he gave his heart to Christ. How wonderful that he gave his heart to Christ before he died. And I'm sure that God saw to that. Payne Stewart was changed because of Christ. Sports Illustrated, just this past week, acknowledged that because he'd become a Christian, his handshakes were a little longer. His smile was more often. He smiled more often. And he listened more. What Sports Illustrated didn't say is he gave more. And he did. When he accepted Christ, he began to give. What a miracle that is. I mean, sometimes, you know, long after Christ touches the soul, he reaches the pocketbook. Payne Stewart this year gave $500,000 to the First Baptist Church in Orlando, Florida. Established a foundation to reach out to children. Gave hundreds of thousands of dollars to cancer research. And whether his gifts were sacrificial in the sight of God, I don't know, but I know this. To Payne Stewart, they must have seemed hilarious. 
I mean, it must have felt like joyful extravagance to begin to give like that. But you see, that's the impact Christ can have on a life. That's the impact Christ wants to have on my life and your life. That we begin to give with joyful extravagance to the work of the kingdom of heaven on earth and to the church of Christ. So soul bountifully. It's what Christ says to us this morning. He who would, if you sow sparingly, you will reap sparingly. If you sow bountifully, you'll reap bountifully for the kingdom of heaven and for yourselves. As God will bless you. You'll be enriched in every way, Paul says. And give hilariously with joyful extravagance. Let's look to the Lord with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, you have shown us how to give because you left your throne of glory and you came to earth born in a manger. You've shown us how to give because you lowered yourself and you took our flesh upon yourself and you shared in our humanity. You've shown us how to give because you went to the cross and you gave your life for us. The Bible says, though you were rich for our sakes, you became poor that we might become rich. Lord, you've said it's more blessed to give than to receive. Teach us to be givers for your kingdom's sake Lord, for our sake, for your church's sake, help us to sow bountifully and give hilariously. We love you. We pray these things in your great name. Amen.